Hi guys, it's fair to say I've been dreading making these set of videos but it's a new spec and I am going to try and tackle the whole of chemistry AQA. I have got no idea how long this is going to take. I'm obviously going to have to go through it as quickly as possible, otherwise we'll all be sat here for like 100 hours. One thing, I'm going to add some timings in the description below so you can try and find out which topic it is you're after so you don't have to sit and watch the whole thing in case it's just one thing you're after. So, starting from chapter one then, chemistry. I've got my notes to help me sort out what I'm going to say, but let's just get going then. So first of all, let's start by defining an element. Now an element is a substance which contains only one type of atom and cannot be split by any chemical means. And remember those elements are found inside the periodic table. When we're talking about a compound, we need to know that it's two or more elements chemically combined. So the key word here is chemically combined. If, if it's not chemically combined, then it's a mixture. So the next definition is what is a mixture? Well, it's two or more elements not chemically combined. So as you can see, those definitions are very, very similar. Now we're going to look at how we're going to separate different types of substances. And this will tend to be mixtures because they're far more easy to separate than compounds, as we've just heard from the definitions. So first of all, we need to look at some key terms. So first of all, the word solute. Now a solute is a solid which dissolves into a solvent. What is a solvent? A solvent is a liquid in which the solute dissolves. So if you're dissolving coffee in water, the solute is the coffee, it's the solid that dissolves, and the solvent is the water. Next up, solution, which is a mixture of a solvent and a solute. Saturated is the name of a solution where you can't dissolve any more solute. Soluble is the name given to something which can dissolve. Insoluble, therefore, is something which cannot dissolve. Now we're going to look at how do you separate an insoluble sol solid or a solute from a solvent. So the easiest way to do this is by filtration. So you're going to set up your filter funnel, your filter paper, you're going to pour through your solution, the solid will stay behind in the filter and you'll be left with the solvent in the beaker below. So that's nice and straightforward. How about if you've got a soluble solute or soluble solid well obviously it's going to dissolve in the water or the solvent and it's going to pass straight through so you can't use filtration in this case instead you're going to use evaporation so you're going to place your evaporating basin on top of a bunsen burner you're going to heat it to get rid of the excess liquid and you're going to allow crystals to form and that's how you separate a soluble solid from a liquid now we're looking at how you separate liquids of different boiling points, so that could be a mixture of ethanol and water for example. This time you're going to use distillation and what happens in this case is you heat both the liquids, they're mixed together and the liquid which has the lower boiling point, in this case it will be ethanol because its boiling point is around 78 degrees, will evaporate first of all and it will rise, cool and condense. So you'll be able to take away the ethanol and then later at 100 degrees the water will evaporate so you'll be able to tap that off separately. If you've got lots of liquids of different boiling points, you're going to use fractional distillation and that's what is used in crude oil. So remember crude oil contains lots of different hydrocarbons of different lengths, so you need fractional distillation in order to separate that. Now there's a little bit about the history of the atom because they didn't actually know that it was a central nucleus surrounded by shells of electrons. So if they ask you what the Thompson's model um, suggested, remember that's the plum pudding model, and you can think of a plum pudding like a Christmas pudding. So they think that the electrons were the plums or the currents surrounded by a sponge which they thought was positive charge. So if they ask you to draw that, just draw a Christmas pudding with some plums and label the plums electrons and the sponge positive charge. Obviously that was wrong, so Rutherford came along and did the gold foil experiment and remember he fired alpha particles at gold foil and he looked at the level at which they were deflected in order to help him work out what the structure of the atom was actually like. Now because most of those alpha particles passed straight through, it told him that the atom is largely empty space, which is why the plum pudding must have been wrong. Second of all, only some, very few number actually, of the alpha particles were deflected. Now, because alpha particles are positive charge, it told them that what was causing the deflection was a positive charge. That told them that the nucleus was positive, and we now know that the nucleus is full of protons. Because only few of those particles were deflected, again, that backed up the idea that an atom is largely empty space. It also told them that the nucleus is very, very small. Lastly, they want you to know about what Bohr's experiment, or Bauer, I don't know how to pronounce his name, experiment showed. And actually, all his experiments showed were that electrons were arranged at different distances away from the nucleus, and we now call those shells. 
Now we're going to dip straight into the periodicity topic, so we're going to look at the structure of an atom more closely. So as I've already said, the nucleus is made up of protons, and you also find neutrons in there. Now they both have a mass of one, but they have different charges. A neutron, being neutral, has zero charge. Proton has a one plus charge. That just leaves the electrons, which are in the shells surrounding the nucleus, they have a negative charge and they have a very, very small mass and you can write that mass as 1 divided by 2000. So it's a fraction, it is absolutely tiny. If they ask you what an atom is, you want to say it's the smallest particle of an element that can exist. And a molecule is two or more atoms bonded together. Don't get it confused with a compound. In a molecule, the two atoms can be the same element, like a hydrogen molecule. But again, water is a molecule, but that has different elements, so it's hydrogen and oxygen. So just make sure you've got those very clear. Molecule is to do with how many atoms are bonded together. Compound is to do with how many elements are bonded together. If we look more closely at the periodic table now, because the periodic table is the most important bit of chemistry, you'll look and you'll see the key. Make sure you use the key. And you'll see that the mass number tends to be the top number. Make sure you use the key in order to back up what I'm saying. Now the mass number is made up of the total of the protons and neutrons. So if you add their numbers together, you'll get the mass number. The electrons have nothing to do with that. The bottom number is the atomic number, and this is the proton number. And that is also the same as the electron number. Why can we say that? Because atoms are neutral. So the bottom number is the atomic number, which is the proton number. Now we need to look at isotopes. Now, you need to learn a very specific definition of an isotope. An isotope is atoms with the same element, with the same number of protons, but different number of neutrons. And this means they have a different mass number. So you will see something like chlorine exists in an isotope because you'll see that its atomic number, its proton number stays the same, but its mass number and neutron number changes. If you're asked to calculate the relative abundance of each isotope, you simply need to multiply the percentage of that isotope by its mass number, add it to the second percentage times by its mass number, and then divide by 100. And I'll show you that equation now. It's just a matter of plugging in the numbers. Looking again at the periodic table, remember that the columns are called group numbers and the group number, which you'll see at the top, corresponds to the number of electrons in the outer shell. So lithium is in group 1, which means it has one electron in its outer shell. Fluorine, group 7, seven electrons in its outer shell. The horizontal rows, we call those the periods, and their number corresponds to the number of shells of electrons. So something like oxygen is in period 2, and its electron configuration is 2.6, so it has two shells of electrons, it's in period two. Remember when you're filling up electron shells that the first shell contains two electrons, and then after that you fill by eight. And if you're asked to draw the shells, you need to draw a circle, two crosses in the first shell to represent the first two electrons, and then make sure you're filling up to eight. Don't go into a third shell until the second shell has eight electrons in it. They often ask you why the noble gases are so unreactive. Remember noble gases are in group 8 or group 0, you can interchange those numbers. The reason why they're so unreactive is because they have a full outer shell. Why, does, why is group 1 so reactive? Because it only has one electron in its outer shell, so it wants to very quickly lose that electron in order to gain a full outer shell. Because that's all the elements really want to do, is they want to gain a full outer shell, so that's why they'll enter into reactions. Now they want you to know about the history of the periodic table, so they'll ask you what Newlands did in terms of his ordering of the periodic table. You're going to say that he arranged the elements in order of atomic mass, and he did not leave space for undiscovered elements. So why was Mendeleev's periodic table an improvement of Newlands? Because Mendeleev, A, left spaces for undiscovered elements, B, he predicted the properties of those undiscovered elements, C, he arranged the elements in order of atomic mass. Now we know that's now incorrect because the modern day periodic table is arranged in order of atomic number, but Mendeleev was definitely on the right track. We're now going to discuss the group one elements in more detail. These are the alkali metals, so they're the first column in the periodic table. So why does the reactivity increase as you descend the group? So as you go down the group, you will find that something like potassium is more reactive than lithium. The reason is, is because potassium is larger, it has more shells of electrons, the outer shell electron is further from the nucleus, it's more shielded, and therefore it's easier to lose that outer electron. And you need to use those exact words in order to score four marks. They like to ask you some observations with group 1 metals. 
in terms of what happens when you add them to water. So things you can say, which is true for all group one metals, is they fizz, releasing hydrogen gas, that's what fizzing actually means. They move around, they float, and they eventually sink, and they turn the water purple when you add universal indicator to it, which means that they're alkali. Now you'll get slightly different reactions depending on which element you're talking about. With sodium you'll actually get an orange flame and with potassium you'll get a lilac flame. Let me talk about the reactions now when those metals are added to water. So if you add a metal to cold water, what you find is you get a metal hydroxide plus hydrogen. So in the case of lithium, lithium plus water makes lithium hydroxide plus, plus hydrogen. If you add them to steam rather than cold water, you get an oxide made. So lithium plus steam will produce lithium oxide plus hydrogen, and the same is true of all metals. Now we need to talk about displacement reactions to do with the halogens. Now remember halogens are group 7, so that's fluorine, chlorine, iodine, bromine. And remember what you do is you react them with a compound, and the more reactive halogen will displace the element from its compound. So you do find that as you descend the group, the halogens become less reactive. We can actually explain why using the same argument as with the group one elements. The reason it becomes less reactive as you go down the group is because the elements are larger, they have more shells of electrons, the outer shell electrons are more shielded, and therefore that means it is harder to gain that eighth electron, because remember with group seven, they'll choose to gain an electron to become full, rather than losing seven, because it's much easier to gain one than lose seven. So in terms of their reactivity, you'll see that chlorine will displace potassium iodide, potassium bromide. You'll see that bromine will displace potassium iodide, but it won't displace potassium chloride. That's because iodine is less reactive than chlorine. So just make sure you're comparing and you, you know that the top of the group is more reactive and I'm going to add a summary table to show you because I think that will be easier for you to see. If they ask you some properties of the halogens, you want to say they have low melting and boiling points and they are poor conductors of heat and electricity. Now we're going to look at the transition metals. What are the physical properties of transition metals? Well, they have high melting and boiling points, they're good conductors of heat and electricity, they're hard, they're strong, and they have high densities. They may ask you about the properties of transition metal compounds. Remember that they form coloured compounds. They have variable valencies, such as iron 2, iron 3, and they form coloured compounds. Now we want to look at states of matter, so we're talking about solids, liquids and gases. If they ask you to describe the properties of each of those, you're going to talk about a solid as having particles held tightly in fixed positions. They vibrate very little and they have strong forces between the particles. Liquids, the particles are slightly further apart, they have middling sized forces holding those particles together and they vibrate a bit more. Gases, they, the particles are far apart, the forces between them are very weak and they move around freely. Now we're on to ionic and covalent bonding. Summary of ionic bonding occurs between metals and non-metals. Make sure that you're aware of that and you're going to draw brackets in order to demonstrate those ions. So if we're going to bond lithium chloride, for example, what's going to happen is lithium will donate an electron to chlorine so that lithium now has a full outer shell. Chlorine has gained an electron, so it has now got a full outer shell, and you need to add charges to show that, and I'll add a picture of lithium chloride now. With covalent bonding, you're looking at non-metals only, and this time you're sharing electrons, which is when you need to do the flower diagrams. So no brackets, and you need to show them overlapping where you'll be sharing electrons. So I'm going to draw you water now, so you've got a good idea of what covalent bonding looks like. If they ask you for a definition of covalent bonding, you're going to say it's a shared pair of electrons. If they ask you what an ionic bond is, you need to say that it's the strong forces of attraction between oppositely charged ions. Now we're going into the chemical structures part of chemistry. So I've already mentioned what an ionic and covalent bond is. Now we're going to describe the reason why ionic compounds have high melting boiling points. And that's because they have strong forces of attraction between oppositely charged ions, which require a lot of energy to break. 
why are ionic compounds brittle and what brittle means is when you hit them they fall apart the reason that they're brittle is when a force is applied ions with the same charge end up next to each other the charges repel causing the whole structure to fall apart why don't ionic substances conduct when solid well that's because the ions are not free to move why do ionic substances conduct when molten or in solution and that's because the ions are free to move to carry the current now we're going to look at just straightforward metals. So to describe the structure of a metal, well it's made up of positive ions surrounded by a sea of delocalised electrons. What is an alloy? Well an alloy is a mixture of two or more metals. Why do alloys tend to be harder than pure metals? And that's because the layers are distorted and that's due to the fact that ions have different sizes, which means the layers can't slide over each other so easily. So that's why alloys are harder than pure metals. What does the word malleable mean? It means it can be hammered into shape. What does the word ductile mean? It means that it can be drawn into a wire. Now we're going to look at giant covalent structures. Now, that's examples of this is things like graphite and diamond or silicon dioxide. Now, why does diamond have such a high melting point? So you can say it has a giant tetrahedral structure, which means that each carbon atom is bonded to four others. Then you talk about the fact it has many strong covalent bonds, which require a lot of energy to break. If they ask you why graphite has a high melting point, say the same thing, but just say that each carbon atom is bonded to three others. If they ask you why graphite conducts electricity, but diamond doesn't, you're going to focus in on those electrons. So you're going to say in, in graphite, each carbon atom is only bonded to three others, meaning that there's a free electron to carry the current. In diamond, there's no such free electron. Why can graphite be used as a lubricant or why is it slippery? And that's because the carbon atoms are arranged in layers with weak intermolecular forces between them so the layers can slide. Now with this particular topic, please use the exact wording I'm using because people often get confused and end up arguing with themselves. So do try and use the exact wording that I'm using now. The last type of structure we need to look at is simple molecular substances. So something like methane or carbon dioxide. If they ask you why simple molecular substances have a low melting point, you're going to say because they have weakened molecular forces which do not require a lot of energy to break. Now we're talking about nanoscience. So what is nanoscience? Well, it's the study of small particles which are between 1 and 100 nanometers in size. They ask you for some uses of nanoscience. You want to talk about sunscreen, you want to talk about glass which repels dirt, you want to talk about drugs being introduced into your body. Laura! Are you here to help everyone? Yeah. Yes! <gasps> Who's got a pretty little kids on face? So sweet! Come and help everyone with their chemistry. Don't growl! It's not nice when you growl. Good girl. Don't be so grouchy. Right, she's going to sit on my lap and help me explain titrations. So remember titration is all about working out the exact volumes of acid and alkali needed to react in order to form a neutral solution. You use something like phenolphthalein or methyl orange, which are both indicators, to work out the exact point at which neutralisation has occurred. Now you'll have to be able to do calculations and also discuss how the equipment is set up in order to carry out a titration. So let's do that first of all. First of all, we're going to use a pipette to measure out a known volume of alkali into a conical flask. Then you're going to use the burette and fill that with acid. At this point you'll add indicator to the conical flask containing the alkali and then you'll open the tap on the burette to allow that acid to start feeding through. Towards the end of the titration you're going to have to add it dropwise because after all we're after the very accurate volume of acid needed to neutralise. You're going to be swirling the flask continually in order to ensure that the acid and alkali are properly mixed and you'll put the whole thing on a white tile and that will enable you to work out the colour change. See, that wasn't so bad. You made me drop my notes, kitten. So that is how you carry out titration and those are the exact steps you'll need. Next question is, why don't most reactions produce 100% yield, i.e. Why doesn't 100% of what you put in come out the other end? That's because many things happen. First of all, some of the product may be lost. 
Secondly, the reaction may be reversible. And thirdly, the reaction may cause unexpected products to be produced. So one of those three things is the answers you'll have to be giving. Now we're going to talk about the reactivity series. Remember that this is a list which places the metals in order of their reactivity and it also includes carbon and hydrogen often because although they're non-metals they provide good reference points. Now in terms of working out where an unknown metal goes in the reactivity series, the first thing you do is react that unknown metal with water. If it reacts nice and strongly you know it's going to be very reactive because remember things like potassium, as I've already said, burn with a lilac flame. If it doesn't react, something like gold won't react if you put it in water, that tells you it's very unreactive. So first of all you start by testing with cold water. If there's no reaction you'll then test with steam, which is obviously boiling water. And then after that, if still no reaction you're going to test with acid. And if it really doesn't react with acid then you know it's a very unreactive metal. A displacement reaction is just a fancy way of saying that a more reactive metal boots out a less reactive metal from its compound. So make sure you know your reactivity series so you'll actually be clear on what's displacing what because sometimes you'll get reactions where nothing will happen. Now, for example, a displacement reaction could be between magnesium and copper sulfate. The reason being that magnesium is more reactive than the copper. If you had it the other way around, for example, so it was copper reacting with magnesium sulfate, you'd write no reaction. Why? Because copper is less reactive. However, just for the sake of this bit of the spec, we're going to say that magnesium is reacting with copper sulfate, so we know a reaction will take place. We know that that's aqueous. You must learn these state symbols. It's going to form magnesium sulfate because effectively the copper and the magnesium swap places and copper solid. Now, ionic equations are charges, so... It's an equation where you show the charges of all the ions, so we need to try and work out what those would be. And the way we're going to do that is separate everything into its constituent ions. So we've got magnesium, we can't turn that into an ion because it's a solid. But then we know we've got copper, which is 2 plus, plus SO4, 2 minus. You must learn these ions, guys, otherwise you can't even hope to draw these. Mg is in group 2, so it's 2 plus sulfate SO4, 2 minus again and then copper is solid, so we're going to keep it as it is. Look for the ion, which remains the same on both sides. This is called a spectator ion, so we're going to cross out the SO4 2 minus, and now draw your ionic equations showing your magnesium and your copper separately. So Mg solid is going to form Mg2 plus. Make it neutral, so we're going to add 2E minus. Because we've removed electrons, that is oxidation. If you don't like why I've written that I've if you don't like the fact that I say that's oxidation, the other way of writing this is like this. And in this case, you can see far more clearly how that's oxidation because you've lost electrons. And then we need to do the same with the copper. So we're going from copper Cu2 plus to copper solid, make it neutral. So we're adding 2E minus because we've added electrons. That is reduction. What is the test for hydrogen? Now with these chemical tests you're going to have to be very specific. Remember it is that a lighted splint pops. Ow! Claws! Oi! Can you calm down please? Now we're looking at neutralisation equations. So when you add acid to a base you get a salt and water. So for example, let's take an acid such as hydrochloric acid and we're going to react it with a base such as sodium hydroxide. So what you'll find is happening is you're going to produce the salt which you name by picking the metal name out which is sodium plus the ending on the acid. Next we're going to talk about what happens if you just add a metal by itself to an acid. So let's take magnesium. We're going to react magnesium with nitric acid this time and you're going to produce a salt which will be magnesium nitrate due to the nitric acid but instead of water, you'll get hydrogen. Now we're gonna look at a metal oxide. So if you add a metal oxide, you get the same result as a metal hydroxide. So you get a salt plus water. So for example, we'll take lithium oxide plus hydrochloric acid. So this time you're gonna get lithium chloride plus water. Lastly, 
you, let's take the carbonate. So any metal carbonate plus an acid will produce yet again a salt. This time the byproducts will be water and carbon dioxide because of the carbonate. Make sure that the elements coming in come out the other side. It's really odd when people write carbon dioxide coming out on the right hand side if there was nothing that contained carbon on the reactant side. So taking a metal carbonate, we'll take calcium carbonate, we'll react it with nitric acid and we're going to produce calcium nitrate plus carbon dioxide plus water. Let's look more closely at the reaction between a metal and an acid and when I say that we're going to look at some ionic equations. So the metal I'm going to choose in this case is magnesium and I'm going to be reacting it with sulfuric acid. So let's start with Mg which is a solid plus H2SO4 which is the formula of sulfuric acid. You must learn that guys. And that's going to form the salt which we know is magnesium sulfate which is MgSO4 which is aqueous, plus a gas, which is going to be H2. So now we need to separate this into its ionic equations, and the way we're going to do that is by writing out all the ions present. Magnesium, we have to keep the same because it's a solid. Sulfuric acid, we can break up into H plus ions and SO4 two minus ions, and they're both aqueous. And then we're forming magnesium sulfate, so Mg2 plus aqueous plus SO4 two minus aqueous plus H2, which is a gas. So let's look for our spectator ions, the ones which are unchanged either side of the arrow. We can see that sulfate exists on both sides, so we can get rid of those. So I'm going to put a cross through them, and then we're just going to rewrite um, our equations, one for magnesium and one for hydrogen. So it'll be Mg solid, forming Mg2+. plus. Let's make it nice and neutral, so it's 2E minus. Because the magnesium's lost electrons, we know that's oxidation. And then let's do the same for the hydrogen. It's going from H plus aqueous to forming H2 gas. Again, make it neutral. Be careful because it's diatomic. We need 2H plus up here, which means we need 2E minus. Because we're adding electrons, we know that this is a reduction. Because remember, oil rig oxidation is loss of electrons, reduction is gain of electrons. Now we're going to look a bit more at acids and alkalis. So remember the pH scale is just a way of measuring how acidic or alkaline something is. It ranges from 0 to 14, 0 being very acidic, 14 being very alkali, neutral is pH 7, and remember when you add universal indicator that will turn green. At the alkali end of the scale you'll see blue, at the very acidic end you'll see red. If they ask you what the iron is that's responsible for making something acidic, you want to say H+. If they ask you for the iron making something alkali, the answer is OH-. What is the definition of a strong acid? So something like hydrochloric acid is a very strong acid, carboxylic acids tend to be weak acids, while well, a strong acid is an acid which fully dissociates or ionises completely in water. Now we're moving on to electrolysis, which is a pretty major topic. So let's first of all start with the word electrolysis. What does it mean? Well, remember electro means to do with electricity, lysis means splitting, so it's splitting apart a substance using electrolysis. What sorts of substances undergo electrolysis? Well, that's going to be ionic substances because you have to have both a positive and negative ion. Because remember with electrolysis, what you're doing is you're running a current around a circuit with two electrodes that dip into a solution and what happens is the positive ion present goes to the negative electrode, the negative ion present goes to the positive electrode, and in terms of what you're expected to know, you need to know which ion goes where and why. You also need to be able to draw your half equations. So we need to look at the terms oxidation and reduction, they are key here. So remember, because it's an ion, we're going to want to either gain or lose electrons. So oxidation, in terms of electrons, is oxidation is loss of electrons, reduction is gain of electrons. Why does the ionic compound need to be molten or dissolved in solution? It's so that the ions are actually free to move, so they can actually move over to the electrode that they're interested in. So now we're going to take an example. We're going to take aqueous sodium chloride and we're going to work out what's going to happen at each electrode. So if we take aqueous sodium chloride, we know that there's sodium and chloride ions and there's also H plus ions and OH minus because aqueous means to do with water. Now we need to understand which of those ions will go to the negative electrode. First of all, with the negative electrode, clearly a positive ion will go there because opposites attract. 
It's now a question of working out whether it's gonna be sodium or hydrogen. Your rule here is it's the least reactive element will move to the negative electrode, which is why hydrogen discharges. In terms of on the positive electrode, we've got two options, OH- or Cl-. Now the halogen, group seven, always wins, which means it will be the chlorine which, which discharges, leaving behind in solution sodium and hydroxide. So that's gonna form sodium hydroxide. So they do like to ask you the uses of all these different products. So sodium hydroxide is used in paper making, it's used in making bleach. Chlorine that discharges is used in disinfecting swimming pools because it kills bacteria. It's also used to make bleach and the hydrogen used is used as a hardening agent in vegetable oils to make margarine and also used as a fuel. Let's take a look at the half equations now. So you want to get your hydrogen ion and you've got to work out how that will become neutral and because it's positively charged you therefore need to add negative charge to it which is why you add electrons to the hydrogen ion. Because hydrogen is diatomic, meaning that it's H2, you're gonna to have to add two electrons. Let's take chlorine. Now chlorine is a negative ion, Cl minus. So actually what you wanna do is take away that negativity. So you're literally gonna take away electrons from it. Again, it's diatomic, so you're gonna to wanna to take away two electrons. If they ask you which is oxidation, which one's reduction, you can literally see the plus and the minus signs. So in hydrogen, you've added electrons, so it's reduction and in the chlorine you've taken away electrons which is oxidation and maybe your teachers have taught you or your rig oxidation is loss of electrons reduction is gain of electrons let's talk about the electrolysis of aluminium remember that aluminium comes from the ore bauxite and your this time it's not aqueous you're just going to have molten aluminium now what happens therefore is because it's al3 plus it's going to move to the negative electrode and oxygen is going to form at the positive electrode and you need to know both of those half equations why is it such an expensive process well first of all because aluminium has a very high melting point so what they do is they add molten cryolite to lower that operating temperature so that's the role of the molten cryolite but you will find that it's still very expensive due to high electricity costs. And the second reason is because the oxygen which forms at the carbon electrodes or the carbon anode, because an anode is a posh word for a positive electrode, what it will do is it will burn away that electrode so it will need replacing very often. Tiny little side point to do with electroplating, that's when you cover a substance with a metal. Why might you do this? Well, to cheapen it, because things like jewellery which are electroplated, it's much cheaper if you just get copper and cover it with a tiny thin layer of a precious metal such as silver rather than making the whole necklace out of silver. Second reason is it gives some favourable properties. So chrome, for example, is often used to plate things like on motorbikes and it's nice and resistant to corrosion. And the third really basic point is that it makes objects more attractive. First of all, it's important that you understand the two graphs for endothermic and exothermic reactions. Remember that, that an exothermic reaction is one that gives out heat energy, that's your definition. An endothermic reaction is one which takes in heat energy. And if you actually look at the energy change, if you have an exothermic reaction, you'll have a negative sign. And if you have an endothermic reaction, you'll have a positive sign. And it's really important that you know that. I mentioned the graph, so if you look at an exothermic reaction, you can see that the reactants have more energy than the products because they're at a higher level on the graph compared with the products, which means that the energy change is negative, which is why you'll see a negative sign in front of an exothermic reaction. For an endothermic reaction, you'll see the graph is slightly different. You'll see that the reactants are lower in energy than the products, so you see a positive sign there. you through the energetics part of the spec using a past exam question because that's the easiest way to do it but remember effectively you're going to be doing an endothermic or exothermic reaction so something like a metal might be added to acid or you might use a fuel to heat up some water it's all the same sort of thing but you're going to measure the temperature change and then based on whether the temperature goes up or down you'll be able to work out if it's endothermic or exothermic remember if the temperature goes up the reaction is exothermic if the temperature goes down it's endothermic um, and they always like asking you about sources of error and often that's heat to the surroundings so you'll just write that down. One way you can minimise that is by using something like a polystyrene cup which is a good insulator and adding a lid 
Why do you need to stir the contents? Well, that's to ensure that the reactants are fully mixed. That's just me blurting out things I've seen on past papers and helping you get perfect answers. But let's have a look at the sort of question. So butene C4H10 is a gas at room temperature and pressure. The equation for the complete combustion of butane is as follows. So complete combustion, so obviously that means in plentiful oxygen. Butane is used in an experiment to determine its enthalpy change of combustion. Um, so we've got the experimental setup A, state what the symbol delta H represents, and that's the enthalpy change of the reaction, or you could say the heat energy change. The table shows the results of the experiment. Use this equation to calculate the heat produced when 0 0.725 grams of butane is burned. So look, they've been really kind, because they've actually told you that it's the mass of water they're after. Sometimes they just write mass. Make sure you use the number that is the stuff being heated up, so the water. People get confused and put the mass of butane in there. Don't do that, it's the mass of water. So you're going to be putting in 200, timesing it by the specific heat capacity of water, which is 4.2, times the temperature rise. So you simply need to do 43.7, take 20.2, which is 23.5. So you plug into your calculator 200 times 4.2 times 23.5, and you'll get an answer, which is 20,000 joules having a nightmare with my iPad, which is why I'm not writing it. A student uses the value from part B to calculate the delta H for the combustion of butane. He calculates it as minus 1,580 kilojoules per mole. He's not made a mistake. A data book value is minus 2,887. What is the significance of the negative sign for delta H? Okay, that literally means that the reaction is exothermic. That's all you have to say. The student notices at the end of the experiment the bottom beaker is covered in soot. Suggest how this soot is formed. And the crucial clue at the top was that it mentioned complete combustion. So this soot must have come from incomplete combustion due to a lack of oxygen. Explain how the formation of soot may account for the difference between the delta H value from the experiment and the delta H in the data book. Well, clearly if soot's being made, we think that less energy is actually less heat energy is actually being made to heat the water. So just one of the reasons why the two delta H is different. I actually already alluded that to that at the beginning of the question, and that's due to heat loss to the surroundings. So yeah, I know that's a weird way of showing you these questions, but they're all the same, so I thought that would be the most helpful. Just going to show you how to do bond energy calculations using a past question. So the student uses a table of average bond energies to calculate another value for the molar enthalpy of combustion of methane. The equation for the combustion can be shown using displayed formulae. Use values from the table to calculate the energy taken in when bonds and the reactants are broken. The crucial thing here, then, is this bit. If they haven't given it to you like this, you've got to draw it out because this will be the best way of doing it so you don't make any mistakes. And then it's just a matter of adding up the individual bonds. So that value plus that value plus that value plus that value plus two lots of that value. So let's see what that actually looks like. So we have, I like to write it out, we have four CH bonds. One, two, three, four. Therefore, I need to do, using this table here and that value there, 412, so therefore I need to do 412 times 4. And then on the reactant side, we've got two lots of this. Using the table again here, 496, so we're going to do 2 times 496. Plug those into your calculator, add them up, and you'll get 2,640. Part 2, we're using the values from the table to calculate the energy given out when the bonds in the products are formed. So this time we're looking at these products here. So let's list the bonds again. So we've got OC, and we've got two of them. Using the information in the table, therefore, we need to do 2 times 743. And then, don't get confused here, we've got OH bonds, but there's actually four of them. One, two, and then there's the big two at the front, so that's why there's four of them. So you're going to do four times four, six, three. Plug that into your calculator, and you'll get a value which is three, three, eight. And then we're using our answers to one and two to calculate the molar enthalpy change. This is the only vaguely confusing bit. So what you have to do is take away the um, energy given out in the products away from your value for your energy in the reactants. And if it's negative, it tells you the reaction was exothermic. 
if it's positive, it tells you the reaction was endothermic. So for this um, particular reaction, you're going to do 2,640, take away 3,338, and you'll get a value which is minus 698 kJ per mole. Hi guys, I'm just going to use my iPad to chat through the chemical cells and battery topic, so sorry if it seems a bit boring. Just be aware that the electrical cells and batteries that lots of your phones use, basically they work due to the fact that metals have different reactivity. And the point is that if you dip two metals in salt solution and join them by a wire, the more reactive metal will donate electrons to the less reactive metal and that forms the basis of a simple electrical cell. They need to have different reactivities, otherwise you can't donate any electrons. So if they ask you, for example, why you can't make an electrical cell using two electrodes made from zinc, it's because you're using zinc twice, so there's no difference in the reactivity. One thing to point out, that in order to increase the voltage, you want to pick metals with very different reactivities, so one that's very reactive and one that's pretty unreactive. However, I'm just going to show you the um, ionic equations and how you're actually going to go about it. So, for example, you could have zinc. Ooh, grey, intriguing. I'm going to add it to a solution of copper sulphate. And that's going to form, because zinc is more reactive than copper, it will displace it. So it will, zinc, it will form zinc sulphate, which is aqueous, plus copper solid. Now in terms of working out your ionic equations, this is how you're going to do it. You're going to take each component and you're going to convert it into ions. Now because zinc is a solid, you can't change that, so we're going to do this. I'm just going to write, or we'll move it around a little bit, we're going to write zinc solid, and then we're going to break up the copper sulphate into its constituent ions. So remember copper is Cu2+. Which is aqueous, but I'm going to really struggle to fit that on. Sulfate ions are SO42 minus, again, aqueous. And then because we've got aqueous zinc sulfate, we can form those two ions, which is going to be Zn2 plus aqueous plus the sulfate ion, which is SO42 minus aqueous. And then the copper solid, so you just got to leave it as it is. And then when we work out our two ionic equations, you need to get rid of the spectator ions. Now, spectator ions are things which appear on both sides and are unchanged by the reaction. So we can see that's the sulphate. So we're literally going to cross those out. And then we're going to form our two new ionic equations, just making sure we keep the um, equations separate. So we only have zinc in one of the equations and copper in one of the others. And I'll show you what that looks like. So we're going to get Zn solid and it's going to form Zn2 plus aqueous. Now, because it needs to be a neutral solution, what do we need to do? We need to add two electrons here. And because effectively you've taken away um, electrons, that's oxidation. Another way of writing that, which you might be more familiar with, is this. And then let's sort out the copper. So we know on the left-hand side we've got Cu2+, plus and it's forming copper solid on the right-hand side. How do we get that nice and neutral? Well, we add 2e- minus over here, and therefore, because you've added electrons, that is reduction. So that's how you're going to do it. You'll be given your equation, or you'll have to write it out, to be fair, because AQA has gotten harder this year. You need to separate it into its constituent ions, delete the spectator ions, and then write both equations complete with their electrons, and then you can work out if oxidation or reduction has occurred. Now we need to chat about fuel cells, and we're basically talking about hydrogen-powered vehicles. The reason we love hydrogen is because of the equation involved, which is this one, which is hydrogen plus oxygen forms water, and that's the reaction that actually takes place in order to release all that energy. The fantastic thing here is that water is made rather than carbon dioxide and that means that you won't be contributing to the greenhouse effect and global warming and you won't be adding atmospheric pollutants because after all we drink water all day long. It is not a pollutant. Now using hydrogen fuel could reduce the effect of the human impact on global warming but the issue is is the fact that this hydrogen is a gas and gases are incredibly hard to use as fuels because think about your parents at the petrol station, they're pumping out liquid petrol or diesel into their cars. It's very hard to store hydrogen because it is a gas. 
The other thing is, in terms of purifying the hydrogen, that involves electrolysis, which requires a massive electricity input. Where does electricity come from? Well, it's fossil fuel burning. So we kind of got some issues with the fact that this is a clean type of energy, but the processes required to purify that hydrogen um, mean that it's not necessarily perfect. More recently, we've been using fuel cells, and this time what we do is we feed hydrogen and oxygen in. You need to look at a couple of equations which you need to learn for the um, higher level. And so what happens here is the hydrogen gas is supplied to the fuel, is supplied as the fuel to the negative electrode, and it diffuses through the electrode which is made out of graphite, graphite, platinum, that sort of thing, and make good electrodes because they're very unreactive. What you find is that hydrogen reacts with hydroxide ions and forms water and extra electrons, and this is what that equation looks like, which you need to learn. So hydrogen is diatomic, hence why it's um, H2. We're going to add it to 4 OH-, which is your hydroxide ions. They are aqueous, and it's going to form 4 lots of water, which is a liquid, plus 4 E-. Minus. At the other electrode, you've got oxygen being supplied, so that's supplied to the positive electrode, the anode, and it diffuses to the graphite and reacts to form hydroxide ions, which accept electrons from the external circuit. So the equation for that is oxygen gas plus two lots of water forms hydroxide ions, which is 4OH minus aqueous. One of these topics that you should just learn off by heart. And then what you see when you add the electrode equations together, because you've got OH- minus on both sides of the equation, here and here, do you see that they would cancel each other out? So your overarching final equation would literally cancel down to this. And as we can see, the only waste product here is water. So in terms of learning advantages and disadvantages, the advantages of hydrogen fuel cells is they do not need to be electrically recharged, no pollutants are produced, and they can be a range of sizes for different uses. The disadvantage you should learn is that hydrogen is highly flammable, sometimes it's produced by non-renewable sources, and it is difficult to store, which I've already touched upon. This is how you do balance equations, I always do it the same way. So draw a line separating both sides of the equation and then list the elements. So we've got hydrogen, chlorine, zinc, carbon and oxygen. And then just copy it across exactly as you've done it. Keep them all lined up, that's crucial. And then you're going to use the tally chart to work out how many atoms you have of each element. So we've got one hydrogen, one chlorine, one zinc, one carbon and three oxygens. Let's do the same for this side. Hydrogen's two, chlorine two, zinc one, you've got one carbon, and you've got three oxygens. And now it's just a matter of comparing them. Okay, well, we don't have enough um, hydrogen and chlorine on this side, so you'll put a two here. Remember, you have to add a big number at the front. That's the only thing you're allowed to do when balancing equations. Make an adjustment, because we now have two hydrogens, two chlorines. Step back, and yes, you can see they're all balanced, so that is done. Here's another example, so line down the middle, list your elements, iron, oxygen and hydrogen, copy them across, and then tally chart, we've got one iron, the three applies to everything inside the brackets, so that's three oxygens, three hydrogens, two irons, three plus four, so that's four oxygens, and then two hydrogens. The obvious thing here to do is match up those ions first of all, so we're going to put a two there, adjust. Um, and the two applies to everything. So you now have six oxygens and you have six hydrogens. And then we don't have enough on this side, so I'm going to pick a sensible number which would be three here because it means that I now have six hydrogens. And then readjust your oxygen so you've got three oxygens plus three, so that's six. And yay, both sides match, so that's how you do the more tricky ones. Jeff and Leslie are here watching me do the, um, the mole calculations part of this video. So I hope you know they were there with you suffering as well. Um, so Jeff and Leslie are Martin's parents. <laughs> going to show you how to do an empirical formula calculation. You want to lay it out in exactly the same way. So first of all, pick out your two elements, which we have iron and chlorine, and you're going to list them at the top, Fe and Cl. Then draw a nice table and you want to put the following subheadings, mass, MR, so that's relative formula mass and number of moles. Remember your triangle, 
which is mass at the top, MR, number of moles, and then pop into that table the information you've been given. So you've been told it's 2.8 grams of iron and 5.325 grams of chlorine. Use your periodic table to work out the MR. Iron is 56, chlorine is 35.5. Then you can use your formula triangle to work out the number of moles by covering up the number of moles and doing mass divided by MR. So 2.8 divided by 56 is 0 0.05. 5.325 divided by 35.5 is 0 0.15. Then identify the smallest number here, which is obviously this one. You want to divide both sides by the smallest number. And that will give you your ratio, which is 1 to 3. Perfect. So your formula is FeCl3. Make sure you write it out, and that's how you do it. Now I'm going to show you how to do titration calculations, and it will look something like this. So we've got the volume of acid, which is 25 centimetres cubed, the concentration, and then the volume of lithium hydroxide, and, no, and now they want us to find the moles. Right, I always lay it, lay it out like this, regardless of what the question's asking, just to help you sort it out. So you want to write out the balance symbol equation first of all, again. And we know I'm a big fan of tables, so draw it as a table. And this time you're going to do NCMV, number of moles, concentration and volume. So number of moles, concentration and volume. And then let's look at what we've been given. So we've been told the volume of sulfuric acid is 25 centimetres cubed. So I'm going to pop that in here at the V under sulfuric acid, but divide by 1,000 because you need to convert it to decimetres cubed. Don't forget to do that. You've been told the concentration of sulfuric acid 0.107 and then the volume of lithium hydroxide is 22.85 again that needs converting to decimeters cubed so divide by a thousand then it's quite straightforward you can see there's a nice gap here so you're going to work out the number of moles by covering up the moles so you can see you do concentration times volume so do 25 divided by a thousand times it by 0.107 to get 2.675 times 10 to the minus 3 now it's important that you compare the big numbers in front of the formula. There's a big 2 here, so you need to take that number that you've just worked out and multiply it by 2. 5.35 times 10 to the minus 3. And then it's ideal because you've got a missing concentration here. So you're going to do number of moles divided by the volume, which is 0.2341. Now I've done an awful lot of working, let's actually look at what the question was asking, which is calculate the number of moles of sulfuric acid. So that is this number here, because that's the number of moles, and that's sulfuric acid. So that's 2.68 times 10 to the minus 3. Calculate the number of moles of lithium hydroxide. We've already done that, so that's 5.35 times 10 to the minus 3. And lastly, calculate the concentration of lithium hydroxide. I've already done that. And by doing this, you'll always make sure you get the right answer. So now we're looking at reacting masses type of questions. So I've just made this one up out of my head, but it's the same sort of thing you'll be asked. So 3.75 grams of calcium carbonate reacted, find the mass of hydrochloric acid. So again, table, make sure your equation is balanced. Mass, MR, number of moles. So we've been told the mass is 3.75 grams. We're looking for the mass of hydrochloric acid, so we're going to put an X. Use your periodic table to work out the MR of calcium carbonate. So you're going to do, actually, I already know the answer, it's 100. And then hydrochloric acid, it's 35.5 plus 1, so that's 36.5. Now we can work out the number of moles using that triangle again, which is mass MR moles. So it's mass divided by MR, so 3.75 divided by 100. I should have done that in my, in my head. 0.0375. Then it's a matter of looking at the big numbers. There's a 2 here, so you need to double that number that you've just worked out and write it in here. And then we've now got the MR and the number of moles, so the mass is worked out by multiplying those numbers together. So your mass of hydrochloric acid is 2.74 grams. Now we're looking at how to work out volumes. So what volume of hydrogen would be produced when 0.8 grams of calcium is added to hydrochloric acid? Tricky this, so you're going to have to start by writing out the balanced symbol equation. So we've got calcium, 
reacting with hydrochloric acid and we know it's going to produce a salt which will be calcium chloride plus hydrogen. Then we need to balance it. If you don't like what I'm doing, just look at the next bit of my video and I'll show you how to write formulae in that bit. So that's balanced. So we're going to lay it out as per usual as a table, mass MR moles. We've been told we've got 0 0.8 grams of calcium. We want the MR of calcium, which is 40. So the number of moles is 0 0.8 divided by 40, which is 0 0.02. Let's look at that number, right, it's a 2, so we need to double this. So we've got 0.04 moles of hydrochloric acid. Um, why am I doing this? This is why you shouldn't do this, because I've gotten so carried away that I've forgotten what the question's about. I'm looking for the volume of hydrogen. Oh my goodness. So we look at the big number in front of hydrogen. It's a 1, so it's the same as calcium. So we just take that 0.02 across. Now to work out the volume, you simply have to times it by 24. Because remember, one mole of a gas occupies 24 decimeters cubed. So just times it by 24 and you get an answer which is 0 0.48 decimeters cubed. If you want that in centimeters cubed, times that number by a thousand. Don't get caught out and don't waste your time like I just did then. Now we're looking at percentage atom economy, which is actually easier than it sounds. So you're looking for your MR of desired product and you divide that by the MR of the reactants and you times it by 100. So I'm going to look at the percentage atom economy of extracting lead. So our desired product is the PBO. So we're going to do the MR of PBO divided by the MR of all the reactants. So that's the MR of PBS and O2. We're looking for the MR of PBO, but make sure you acknowledge the two. So you do 207, which is the MR of lead, plus oxygen, which is 16, times that by 2 get an answer which is 446 and then we need to do 2 PBS so that's 207 plus 32 times it by 2 plus 3 lots of O2 so it's effectively 3 lots of 32 you can get an answer which is 574 and then pop that into your calculator And your answer is 77.7%. Now we're looking at working out the limiting reactant. So we've got 4.8 grams of magnesium reacting with hydrochloric acid, which is 7.3 grams. Which reactant is limiting? So we'll need our equation, which is magnesium plus hydrochloric acid, and that will make a salt, which is magnesium chloride plus hydrogen. Balance it. And then you're going to put it into a table with mass, MR, and number of moles. You've been told you've got 4.8 grams of magnesium, 7.3 grams of hydrochloric acid. Well, the MR here is 24 from the periodic table, 36.5 because that's hydrogen plus chlorine. We work out the number of moles, so that's 4.8 divided by 24 for magnesium, 0 0.2. 7.3 divided by 36.5, which is 0. 2, and then to work out which one's limiting, divide both of these numbers by the big number to get an answer which is 0 0.2 for magnesium and 0 0.1 for hydrochloric acid. Because that number's smaller, you know that hydrochloric acid is the limiting reagent. I'm just going to show you how to work out the formula of common compounds. I'm going to show you the quickest, easiest way and it is called swap and drop. So you'll be asked for something like work out the formula of aluminium oxide, but obviously you don't know because that's the final answer there. So what you do is you grab the ion for aluminium, the iron for oxygen, and then you swap and drop, which means you take the three from aluminium and drop it down to oxygen, and you take the two and drop it down to aluminium, so your final formula is Al2O3. The reason why that works is because you have on both sides 6 plus and 6 minus charge which means they balance out. Check out my common ions video if you're not following. But just remember those little numbers must go at the bottom. We take the second example calcium chloride, we swap them over so the 2 lends itself to chlorine down here, the 1 which because although you can't see the 1 that's what that minus means, it means it's 1 minus, you take that down to here and because it's 1 you don't need to write it. So the final answer here is calcium chloride CaCl2. Slightly more tricky example here, which is ammonium sulfate. You're taking the 2 down from sulfate and dropping it here. 
you've got the one at the top for ammonium and taking it down to here. Now, luckily, that's actually all you have to do. Don't get freaked out when it looks confusing because I promise it's, it's simple as long as you follow these rules.